and welcome to Ministry to Muslims. My name is Carmen and I am your host tonight. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight and I want to thank everyone that tunes in every week that is faithful. We appreciate you guys. Um, I also have a few a few things that I'd like to talk about. First, um, if this is your first time joining, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. Um, and by you sharing this video, it also helps with our algorithm and it, it reaches more people. So um, please, uh, let's see, Pastor George and Ministry to Muslims, they are in Arizona, uh, Phoenix, Arizona at the Arab Festival. So please keep them in prayer. Um, we could really appreciate that. Um, your prayers are very important to us because, you know, if you can't help us financially, um, which you could go to ministry to muslims.com and you can give your support there. But, you know, we always appreciate prayers because um, we are trying to reach the lost Muslims. And with your prayers and support, it really means a lot. Um, so. I have some updates. Uh, let's see. July, and Ministry of Muslims will be in De the Detroit area. I'm not sure on the dates with that, but we will post them. I, I'm pretty sure they're on the ministrytomuslims.com page. Um, and also coming up in August, we have um, our first annual Seek and Share the Truth Conference, August 4th through the 6th. And that is going to be in Ohio. And our special guests will be David Wood and Hatun Tosh. Um, for tickets, go to Eventbrite, and if you can't join us in person, you can, you'll can you be able to view online uh, while it's happening, so that's always good, because I know there's a lot of people that tune in from all over the world, and they're not able to, to be there in person, although they would like to. And so today, we have a special guest, Olin Giles, and he is going to be talking about, is John 14, hi, Olin. Hello. <laughs> Is John 14, 16 about Muhammad or the Holy Spirit? Um, I know that's a big topic. That's something that a lot of Muslims like to say that Muhammad is in the Bible. And so they always refer to that scripture. So we're going to hear how you're going to tell them how it's not, right? <laughs> yes, right. Okay. So it, the floor is all yours. And all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you you're so welcome. much, Colin. You're welcome. All right, so is John 14, 16 about Muhammad or the Holy Spirit? You know, I think the average Christian finds this question perplexing, even laughable. Um, just in the last several days, I've discussed this topic with a few friends who are believers, but they're, they're not really studied on Islam. And all of them have kind of responded with, with the same question, and that, and that is, do they really believe that? Unfortunately, the, the answer is yes. Yet John's gospel gives us some of the strongest and, and clearest revelation about the triune nature of God, the deity of Christ, and of course the indwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit. I've, I've read it many times, but you know, I'm just thinking, even even as an uneducated young believer, you know, I never finished up my reading by thinking. John was predicting the coming of another prophet, someone like Muhammad. That, that, that never happened to me. Really, the, the only way to make this idea seem plausible is, is just to completely ignore the context and to read one's uh, own presuppositions into the text, what we would call eisegesis. And of course, Muslims love to do this. They, they'll take a single Bible verse and, and they try to twist it with an Islamic end but I, I just want to emphasize here in the beginning that the, the typical argument for Muhammad in the Gospel of John is, is far worse. It, it's much worse than that. They would have us believe the Gospel of John has been corrupted and it should contain the Greek word parakletos. You're going to hear these words a lot tonight. Uh, they, they would have us to believe that the text should contain the Greek word parakletos, which means much praised, um, but you actually find the word parakletos or paraclete. Uh, paraclete is, is a little easier to say, so I'll probably be using that tonight instead, instead of para, uh, parakletos. Uh, we'll talk more about these words in a moment, but 
as you may know, the word Muhammad, it means the praised one. So Muslims will point us to the Gospel of John, and they say Jesus is predicting the advent of Muhammad in this passage. And it's, it's very important that we're able to respond um, in a way that uh, it's, it's going to be productive. But, but I want again, I want to emphasize that this entire argument depends on this one word that's not even in the text. It's just such a strange argument. But Muslims are pressured to do this because of what their own sources have to say. Often the, the problem for Islamic apologists is, is not so much what, what Christians say, but what their own sources have to say. And if we look at Surah 7, 157, it starts out by saying, those who follow the apostle, the unlettered prophet whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the law and the gospel. Surah 61, 6, we find Jesus or the Isa of the Quran saying, O children of Israel, I am the apostle of God sent to you, confirming the law which came before me and giving glad tidings of an apostle to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmed. But when he came to them with clear signs, they said, this is sorcery. Um, Alfred Guillaume's biography of Muhammad um, contains a specific reference to the Gospel of John. You can find this uh, on pages 103 and 104. Um, the, short, the short section of this biography um, concludes by saying, in the Greek, he, that is speaking of Muhammad, is the paraclete. So in, in the biography of Muhammad, um, it, it seems to be certain that the paraclete is Muhammad. I mean, that's the statement that's made here. It's quite, quite a statement. But this is nothing new. Muslims have been making this argument for the last 1,400 years or so. And as Surah 61.6 indicates, there, um, there were also those during the, the time of Muhammad who disagreed. They didn't believe this. Um, even during the time and culture of Muhammad, the Quran admits that not everyone agreed. And so I, I just want to make their argument clear. I want to give you a, uh, a standard Islamic Islamic argument, easy for me to say, a standard Islamic argument as we find in, in Yusuf Ali's commentary on Surah 61.6. This is the, the typical argument that Muslims will give, really. Um, reference 54.38 says that Atmag, or Muhammad, the praise one, is almost a translation of the Greek word parakletos in the present gospel of John 14.16. You know, you can't help but parallel this or compare it to the biography of Muhammad, which seems to be certain, but Yusuf Ali says almost. He says it's, it's close. Uh, but he continues on to say that the word comforter in the English version is for the Greek word parakletos or paraclete, which means advocate, uh, one called to help, uh, one called to help another, a kind of friend rather than comforter. Our doctors contend that Parakletos is a corrupt reading for Parakletos, and that in the original saying of Jesus, there was a prophecy of our holy prophet, Ahmed by name, end quote. Yet, all you have to do is, is read the Gospel of John to understand that it has absolutely nothing to do with a 7th century prophet named Muhammad. So I want to read um, John 14, 16, and I'm going to go ahead and read verse 17 as well. It says, I, this is Jesus, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, another parakletos, another paraclete, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you do know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Now, I'm sure you've already noticed several problems for our Muslim friends. And I want to, uh, what I want to do tonight is just kind of go through this, this verse 16 and, and really just highlight some of the difficulties and share with you some of the thoughts that I have. Um, number one, the, the God of John 14 is Trinitarian, not Unitarian. So number one, the God of John 14 is Trinitarian, not Unitarian. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. 
So right here in the beginning of verse 16, we have all three members of the Godhead. That is, I, Jesus, will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. That is the Holy Spirit. And one of the reasons that we know this is because of the context of John 14, 16. The Gospel of John begins with the words, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, or you know, some have said this speaks of being face-to-face -face with God, and the Word was God. Um, just a few verses later, verse 14, the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us, or tabernacles among us. The, the Trinity is revealed to us in Scripture. You know, this is not something that we... Uh, come to you through reason, but we know this because God revealed it to us in the New Testament. That is, God is one in being and three in persons. Um, the word Trinity just simply means triunity. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are co-equal, co-eternal members of, of one essence. So if you think about what is God, he's one. Who is God? He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there's, there's this unity and diversity. And of course, Jesus is the second person who took on the form of a bondservant, um, being made in the likeness of men, Philippians 2. He added a human nature to his divine nature. So it should come as no surprise that, that Jesus says in John 5.30, I, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So there's not three separate gods doing their own thing. They're, they're in unity with everything that they say and everything that they do. John 10, 18, Jesus says, no one has taken his life from him. He has the authority to, to lay it down and to take it up again. But then he says, this commandment I received from my father. John 16, 15, Jesus says, all things that the Father has are mine. I mean, just, just think about this statement. I mean, no mere man could say this. John 14, 16, Jesus asked the Father, and he sends another paraclete. But then in John 16, 7, Jesus says, I will send him to you. So, so these are not contradictions. This, again, is exactly what we would expect from a, a Trinitarian God. But real quickly, before we, uh, before we get into the context of John 14, 16, I want to I wanna take you to 1 John 4, 7 through 8. I think this is, is very helpful in understanding the context of John 14, 16. So in 1 John 4, we're told that everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. You think about love is reciprocal. And just as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have loved each other in eternity past, as disciples of Jesus, we, we ought to uh, not only love God back, but reflect his loving nature. Uh, I mean, everything that we say and everything that we do to those around us. And of course, Jesus did this perfectly. I mean, he, he didn't reflect the, the, the loving nature of God. He, he revealed it. Um, Hebrews 1.3 says that the Son is the exact representation of his nature. And, and again, this is evident in, in the ministry of Jesus. In John 13, we find him washing the disciples' feet, which included Judas, who, who was about to betray him. Then this, this chapter closes out with Jesus giving his disciples a new commandment. I mean, again, think about this. What mere man could come along and say, I'm giving you a new commandment. But Jesus says to love others just as he had, has loved us, or just as he had loved his disciples, so that all men will know that you are my disciples. Jesus was preparing his followers, his disciples, for his departure. That's, that's the context of John um, chapter 13 and, and chapter 14. He's about to leave them. And, and as you read through John 
chapter 13, you can just sense the, uh, the their stress and their anxiety about him leaving. And so chapter 14 begins with, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. The, the antidote for a troubled heart is, is to trust in him just as they had trusted in the Father. So two points that I want to emphasize here. Number one, just as Jesus revealed the love of God, again, the disciples were to reflect his love. Now, I want to stop right here for just a moment because I've, I've repeatedly talked about the love of God, and, and I know that a lot of progressive Christians, a lot of uh, they're not not actually progressive they're actually regressive um, probably a better word is is liberal christians today want they want to redefine this 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 term love and they want to you know redefine the attributes of god but jesus makes it clear in in, in several places um, john 14 6 he says that no one comes to the father except through him so those who reject the love of god will incur the wrath of god by default. John 14, 15, Jesus says that loving him leads to obeying him. If, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so this brings us to John 14, 16 through 17, where where the the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit would, would help them to do this. So secondly, my second point here is just as the Father sent Jesus he now sends his disciples in the power of the Holy Spirit, John 20, 21. So I hope you can see how in, in John 14, 16, Jesus is encouraging his disciples to, to continue on with the divine mission, to continue on with the work that he started. He said he, he, said he would not leave them as orphans, but they would continue on with the divine mission as those who are filled with the Holy Spirit and as those who reflected the love of God. Yet, Allah, you know, you look at you look at the uh, Islamic theology, Allah's love is, is conditional and, and, and really dependent on creation. Um, the Quran consistently says in some way that, that Allah is not a father. This, you know, to, to say that Allah has a son is blasphemy. It, it commits the unpardonable sin of shirk um, surah 6 101 um, basically says that allah is not the father he doesn't have children um, 21 26 is another example and if you go to surah 2 222 it says that that he he only loves those who turn to him constantly so so again his his love is dependent on creation and it's it's conditional on how um, people respond to him. So this is this is very different from the God of the Bible. And of course, Muhammad just doesn't, you know, Muhammad's theology just doesn't fit within this context. And, you know, think about the words of Jesus too. Jesus, you know, Jesus warned us about this kind of uh, superficial and self-centered love in, in John 5, 44 through 48. But I think more problematic is how Allah depends on creation to, to really express a, a divine attribute. There's much, much more that could be said about this problem. But my first point is, is simply that the father of John 14 doesn't fit within Islamic theology. I'm tempted to go on with that, but I want to make sure I get all this in tonight. Um, so secondly, the Greek word for helper is paraclete or Parakletos, not parakletos. Two, two very different words. Parakletos is a it is a Greek word, but it's not, it's not found in the New Testament. Um, Yusuf Ali and Muslims in general they they want to begin with the Quran, you know, without any consideration as to whether or not it's true. And and of course this leads them to to build their entire argument around the word that's not even there. It, it's just not there. John 14, 16 contains the word paraclete. And, and this is a word that, that's unique to John. Um, I love, love to do word studies, and, and I did a little word study on this. And, and uh, para speaks of, of coming alongside of, 
and kletos means to call. So, so this is this word literally means one who is called alongside of another. The, the New American Standard Bible that, that I'm using um, tonight uh, translates it as helper. Uh, the King James uses the word comforter. But I think, I think these words can be misleading. Um, the, the language, especially in the King James, the Old English has, has evolved a little bit, and, and the word comforter today has, has, has taken on just a, a very different meaning than what it did back then. Um, the, the NIV uses the word advocate, and I, and I think this is a better translation. But not once did we find the word parakletos. Every single manuscript that we have, and, and we're going to talk about this uh, shortly, every single manuscript that we have contains the word paraclete or parakletos. And, and we have around 5,800 Greek New Testament manuscripts. They're all in agreement on this word, and they're all in agreement on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Um, there's no other book from antiquity that even comes close to comparing to the doctrinal uh, accuracy and agreement in all of these manuscripts that we have. Um, many of the manuscripts um, have been preserved in a digital format on the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts website. I have uh, I've taken you there before, but I want to give you their uh, website again. It's, it's csntm.org. You, you, you can go there and see for yourself. You can go there and look at P75, a third century manuscript of John 14. Or you could go and look at a fourth century copy of Codex Sinaiticus, which also comes long before Muhammad, obviously. And, and the word Codex is just a, a uh, it's very much like our book today. It's not, it's not a scroll, it's a codex. So it's, it's like a book. Um, Perhaps one of the most well-known manuscripts is P52, the, uh, the John Ryland fragment, which contains John 18. And we also know, even though this is a little fragment, we know that it comes from a codex as well because it has writing on both sides. You could, you could look through all of these manuscripts and you'll not find anything to support the Muslim claim. And you and I, as, as followers of Jesus, we, we can be confident that what we have today in our modern Bibles is what was written um, in the first century just because of the, the care and the accuracy of these manuscripts. Again, they all agree doctrinally. There are some, some variants, but when it comes to um, doctrine, and by the way, we, we, can, we can correct these variants very easily but just because of the sheer number. If we only have two manuscripts and they disagreed, we wouldn't know which one was right. But we have 5,800 manuscripts, and, and most of these variants are simply spelling errors. And, and all you have to do is go back and look at you know, 5,600 manuscripts and compare it to these others who are misspelling uh, certain words. We could also uh, turn our attention to the, the early church fathers. Um, we, we have Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Oregon. There are several others that refer to the Holy Spirit specifically as the paraclete. So if Muslims are going to make this claim, then, then we must absolutely insist that they, they bring some evidence to substantiate their, their claim. Um, I, I have said in the past that that I love it when 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 Muslims bring this to me because you know there are a number of different arguments that are just difficult to answer, not because the truth is not on our side, but just because of the the nature of the argument. But but this is this is an argument when when a Muslim says that John fourteen sixteen predicts the coming of Muhammad and not the Holy Spirit, we can really you know demonstrate with a great deal of certainty that that's not that's not the case so it's again just very important that that we're prepared and we're able to answer um, this objection so number three the message of john 14 was originally given to the first century disciples of jesus um, back to john 14 16 he said that he may be with you 
forever. Throughout this passage, um, Jesus is addressing his disciples, those who were with him. He says, uh, I, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. So in what possible sense could this be about Muhammad? According to Islam, he, he, he doesn't come along, uh, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't come onto the scene until 600 plus years later. And if we go back to the Gospel of John, John 14, 19, Jesus says, after a little while, the world will no longer see me, but here you again, you, first century disciples, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. Now, scholars debate about whether Jesus is speaking of the coming of the Holy Spirit, his second coming, or his resurrection appearances. But one thing is clear in this passage, and that is it will happen after a little while, or as the NIV says, before long. So I believe, I personally believe that Jesus is emphasizing the fact that, that these disciples, these first century disciples, would see his resurrected and glorified body before he ascended into heaven. He says, in, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you, verse 20. I think about how at one point the disciples were hiding in fear behind closed doors while the women discovered the empty tomb. By the way, no man would make that up, a principle of embarrassment. But then we see these same disciples transformed into some of the boldest evangelists that the world has ever seen. They were willing to, to suffer and to die for their faith in Jesus. So they did come to know with, with clarity the deity of Christ. He had uh, addressed them personally, and then he appeared to them in his resurrected body. Contextually, it, it makes no sense to say John 14, 16 is about the prophet of Islam. Muhammad wasn't sent to first century disciples, and he wouldn't come, uh, you know, onto the scene again until much later. Um, that is, if the Islamic dates are accurate and Muhammad was a real historical figure. But then my, my final point, and I'm moving along a little quicker. I thought I had enough content for tonight, but uh, we're moving along pretty good. But number four, the, the Bible explicitly states the helper would be a timeless, spaceless, immaterial spirit. I mean, it says specifically, he is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But here's that word, you again, you first century disciples do know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So here Jesus clearly states that the paraclete is the spirit of truth. And we, we can ask our Muslim friends, is Muhammad a spirit? No, he's a man. Secondly, I think it's important to note that Jesus is the, he's the first paraclete who is the way, the truth, and the life. He, he is now sending another paraclete who is like him, who is the spirit of truth. This can't possibly be Muhammad. Um, again, he, he's a man, he's, he's not a spirit. And secondly, it, it makes no sense, you know, to say that Muhammad is the spirit of truth. He's not the embodiment of truth. Um, he he said war is deceit, and and he encouraged his his uh, followers to practice takia. Um, but the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete, would guide them into all truth. Um, John sixteen thirteen. All the Old Testament prophets spoke of the coming Messiah. The, the entire Bible is about Jesus. He, he's, he's the grand finale. There's, there's no need for another prophet. There's no need for another revelation. So there's no need for Muhammad and certainly no need for the Quran. God took on human flesh, died on a cross, became our righteous 
substitute. I say this often, but, but I want to say it again. We have sinned against an infinitely righteous God. And so what we need is his righteousness. This is exactly what the gospel provides for us. God made him and you know sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. You think about believers today. We are, we are united in him as, as the, the body of Christ. And again, that's the whole point of this sending of the Holy Spirit. And that is we are, as the body of Christ, to, to continue on with the work, to continue on with the ministry of preaching and teaching the gospel, the good news of what God has done through his son. That, that's why we're here every Sunday night. That's why we love Muslims. That's why we uh, seek them out and, and, of course, share the good news with them. So with that said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there, and, and perhaps we have some questions. Um, I, I took about 30 minutes there. Again, I, I expected it to be much, much longer. but uh, It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we speak a little faster. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we do have some questions. Awesome. Uh, I My pronunciation on Greek words is not good, so I'm sure you know how to say this word. But um, if, if you paraclete just... is only used in John's gospel, what word is used in the other gospels for Holy Spirit? Um, that's a good question. I, I didn't say that the word was only used in John's gospel. I said it's only used by John. It is. It is found in, in, in the letter of John, 1 John as well. And here and there, uh, and in 1 John, the paraclete refers to Jesus. Um, the, the Holy Spirit, I, I would have to look to answer that question. Um, and I can do that right quick. By the way, let me just, let me just to, to answer that question, you can go to blueletterbible.org. You know, people may know about it. And then, but uh, you can go to this little website and you can type Holy Spirit. And it will take you to every verse that contains the two words Holy Spirit. You can, you can look at those and you can click on the, uh, it's, it's just like a strong concordance, okay? So you can go to, of course, the word spirit is, is pneuma. I'm just not sure what the uh, the word for holy is. And I'm going to go right here and look at that. So the word, if I can find it here, here it is. Tell me if you can hear this. We don't hear okay, anything. So that's, that's, you didn't hear it? Okay. No. I wasn't sure if you'd be able to hear that or not. So, so the word for holy is hagios. So hagios pneuma, the Holy Spirit. You, you can do, you can search the entire Bible like this on blueletterbible.com. I was, um, I was, re I was um, reading up on, you know, why Muslims believe that um, it's about, Muhammad. And yeah. I don't know um, how many times you've heard this or not, but um, they they believe that we took it out of the Bible, like the word that they use, that we yeah. took it out of the Bible. And that's why they claim that it's corrupted. Um, right. I, I don't understand because I kept thinking to myself, if they if it's so easy to disprove that they're wrong, I mean, not only by continuing to read on the chapter, but also using, you know, like you just said, that resource to go yeah. and read the word and what it means in Greek and all of that. But the reason why I think that they're not even trying to come to terms with that is because they just believe that it was taken out and corrupted and replaced with another word. Yeah. Um, but I think also 
if Muslims can't find Muhammad in the Bible, then, you know, it, they have to come to terms with the Quran yeah. being yeah. wrong. Absolutely. And, that, and that's why there's so much pressure on them to find him. In the, in the, this, this is their best go-to passage right here in John 14, 16. This is, you know, they've had 1,400 years to find Muhammad in the New Testament. And this is where they go. And, and, and by the way, you know, just thinking about everything that you just said, just think about the problems with that. What does the Quran say? The Quran says that none can change the words of Allah. The Quran says, Surah 3.3, 3, that, you know, it, it com that it confirms the law and the gospel, literally what is between their hands. So, so during the time of Muhammad, the gospel was trustworthy. And, and I also think about the fact that, you know, I think it was 61.6, Surah 61.6, where, you know, there were there were people during this time who didn't believe this. So this is a, this is not a new problem for Muslims. But but when you start unpacking all the problems that they have. The, the Quran says that the word of Allah can't be changed. But yet you're telling me that the, the his word was changed. The Quran says that, that it affirms the law and the gospel. But you're telling me that it's been corrupted again. And then, of course, there's absolutely no manuscript evidence. The, the, the word is not in the, the Gospel of John. You know, one, one word, and it's not even there. So it, it's just not much of an argument at all. It's, uh, it's just them wanting him to be there, I think. And, and, of course, a lot of Muslims don't, you know, they don't, they don't study the Quran like we do. And I think that, that, that adds to the problem. Yeah, I agree. They're not encouraged to study. Yeah. They're um they they really just are really dismissive with Christianity yeah. and they just um they don't they've been told I mean it's it's brainwashing. Yeah. If you've been told something your entire life that some that something has been corrupted corrupted, you're not even going to try to see how it if it's true or not because you really believe I mean you've got your parents, your siblings, your your sh local sheikh, your grandma, everyone yeah. telling you that. So yeah. I mean I sympathize but you know you at there also comes a point where you have to take responsibility for your own salvation and and start to you know at least try to disprove it, you know. Um yeah. but they like you said they're not they're not encouraged to do that and I had a friend growing up in high school tell me that the reason why they don't, you know, uh, really try to witness to Christians is because they believe that Christians are going to, that we're going to go to heaven. Yeah. So there's no point. I mean, they're going to, you know, we're going to spend a little time in hell as, as they will, right. but eventually right. we're going to be in mm -hmm. heaven. So, you know, that's, that's their take on it, which yeah. is sad. Thank, thank God for Jesus. You know, I, I grew up as a, as a preacher's kid. And I didn't come to know the Lord until 33 years of age. And, you know, I, I, at one point I remember thinking my wife was praying for me. And, and I remember thinking if I become a Christian, I was, I was thinking of all these things that I was going to have to do. You know, I was thinking in terms of, you know, I'm going to have to go to church. I'm going to have to start reading my Bible. I might actually have to open up the hymn book and sing. You're going to you know, have to stop doing this right. and this and this. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of yeah, it's very common for people to think that way. But what I discovered was I could know him personally. And, and the Lord spoke to me louder than any audible voice I've ever heard through the pages of Scripture. Um, he, he didn't you know, just say anything. He, he spoke to me through his word. And I believe that was the work of the Holy Spirit. For sure. I, I know it was. Yeah. And, uh, of course, he changed my life. And, and I think about... You know, think about Muslims, too. You know, it's, it's it's the Jesus of the Bible. I think I say this a lot, but I'm going to say it again anyhow. Uh, it's the Jesus of the of the Bible that are visiting Muslims in dreams. It's not it's not Muhammad. It's not Isa, but it's the Jesus of the Bible. And this is leading them to the word of God, to the to the Bible. And that's how they're coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Um just a, just a very interesting um, take on, you know, thinking about all of that. And um, after studying John 14, 16, uh, 
aren't you glad that Jesus pursues us and he loves us and uh, he loves Muslim Muslims too. So again, that's why we're here. Yeah, I agree. I, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And, and when we realize that when, you know, how wicked we were in our hearts before Christ and, and then after being saved that we're just so grateful and we want Muslims, we know, we know what the risk is. We know what's at stake and um, it is crucial. And so that's why we do this show. That's why we talk about these things. Mm-hmm. We, you never know um, who's going to run across the page. You know, you know, God works in mysterious ways and this may just answer a question a Muslim had had. And sometimes they're not allowed to go and be so, you know, have so many questions with their family members and, you know, coming across these kinds of questions specifically to answer those questions. It really is helpful. And um, I think, you know, we, we try to do our best and, and we're honest and, and we do it with love because we do love them and we want them to be saved and we care truly. Absolutely. Well, I do have, I mean, if we don't have any other questions, I, I was prepared, you know, kind of jotted down some notes of, of two questions that I really expected. If yeah. you wanted me to touch on them for just a moment. I, yeah, I could. for sure. Yeah. It's, it's not a whole lot, but uh, it might help somebody. So uh, these are just a couple of rejections that, that again, I, I really expected. And, and a lot of times I think Muslims will go to the passage where Jesus says, my father is greater than me. So how can how can Jesus be God if if his father is greater uh, than than he is? And and I think there's there's certainly something to be said about you know I quoted Philippians two earlier where, where Jesus humbled himself or emptied himself and and he took on the form of a, of a bond servant being made in the likeness of of a man. So so as a man Jesus became hungry. But, of course, in his divine nature, he he didn't need to to sustain himself with food. As a man, Jesus died on the cross. But his divine divine nature didn't die. God didn't die on the cross. So, again, I think there's something to be said about the fact that the Father was greater by virtue of his, his status in heaven. But I think we can also say that that the father is, is greater in office, but not in essence. Um, I, I could say that the, the president of the United States is greater than me, but he, he's, he's no more or less, no more or less human than I am. So I, I don't see it. I just really don't see a problem with, with Jesus saying my father is greater than me, especially when he's on earth in human flesh, um, humbled himself and took on the, you know, took on human flesh. Um, I I just don't see any problem with that. um, According to those two points. Um, Jesus also talks about um, greater works that, that would come through the Holy spirit that, that we would do greater works. I, I don't remember the exact passage and I didn't have my, Bible handy here. It's in in John 14 there somewhere where he talks about he would send the Holy Spirit and because he would send the Holy Spirit the disciples would be able to do greater works. And I don't think this is saying that that they would be able to do greater works in quality than Jesus. I mean, Jesus arose from the dead. (laughs) But I think it had more to do with quantity. So this, the disciples were not able to do greater works in quality than Jesus, but greater in quantity. Um, numerically, the work of the, the church through the, the ages would be greater than what Jesus did while he was on earth. I, I think that's what he was talking about. I should have had that passage handy there. But um, those are a couple of objections that, that I've gotten from Muslims and I uh, really expected to hear them tonight. Um, uh, let's see. I don't know how to say your name. Proof Yaffle. If you, um, I don't know. I thought I asked your question. Did you have two questions? Cause the one we asked, maybe you missed it or if I missed it, just go ahead and uh, repost it and I'll make sure to ask it right now. 
I'll give you a minute to do that. I'm gonna grab my Bible too. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if I, I missed it. I could have. I should have had that ready. Did he post his question again, Professor no. Yaffle? All right, well. Yeah. Look like George and I don't know if you were able to watch any of the uh, the conference yeah. out in Arizona, but it, Anthony and Everyone just, just did a great job. Um, oh, you know what? I misread her. <laughs> it, that was my fault. She said, can, you can take my... Can, so her question was left up there. Sorry. Oh, never okay. mind. Okay. Never mind. Sorry about no that. Worries. I read it wrong. I, sometimes I read a little too fast. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, there's no more questions. But, yeah, I did get to watch the, um, the minis them in Arizona. Um, I love that they do that. I love that... Um, I love that they, they post it, at least, you know, for us that can't be there. I will be there next year, though. That is a yeah. promise to myself. I'm going to try to make it there. Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would have loved to have been there, too. Uh, did, did you see the picture of Dr. Dalcor and, and uh, Rogers on the bicycles? I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious. That is the ori know. original bikers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have anything exciting that's coming up or any last things that you'd like to discuss? Um, you speaking, any speaking events? Well, I'll be in uh, Florida in a couple of weeks, Claremont Baptist Church. I'm going to be there on March the 26th. Oh, it's coming and up. And then I have a couple of, uh, I'm, I just got the other one confirmed. I have three other speaking engagements at, a, at another church in Florida. And then I'm coming back to Claremont Baptist Church on April the 23rd to do their morning service. So, uh, again, I should have been a little better prepared. I can't remember the name of the other church, but uh, <laughs> I'll post it in the in the comments, maybe of the video. Okay, yeah, do that because you never know where people are. They like to yeah. come to you for sure. Yeah. Um, and go ahead. I want to say it was in Gainesville, Florida. Gainesville. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. So um, for I don't, I'm not sure who's going to be next week, um, but hopefully you guys will tune in anyway. It's always it can be a surprise. We like surprises here. <laughs> That's how we do things. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Olin, so much for you, providing Bob. us with all this wonderful information. And it's good that people can come back and watch it again. Well, thank, thank you for being here as well. We thank you for all that you do. Thank you. All right, guys. And don't forget to tune in next week. And have a good week, guys. Bye-bye. Good night.